Around the workbench, sometimes it would be nice to be able to automate the switching of various loads, whether something simple like an OED, or something inductive like a solenoid or DC motor drawing up to a couple of amps each. With help from today's sponsor, PCBWay, I made this low side switch that can help. These outputs, along with 16 inputs, are controlled by two MCP2307 GPIO expanders, which use I2C. So by hooking up an external I2C bus, or using the onboard AT-Tiny, we can read inputs and control outputs. And the UART on the AT-Tiny has an RS-485 interface, so we can also, if we set up a sketch, receive control commands or send back status updates over RS-485. Each channel's driver circuit has three functions. There's an onboard LED to indicate the on-off state of each output. There's an open drain MOSFET connected to an output screw terminal, capable of switching a load a couple of amps to ground. And at the same time, there's an open collector NPN transistor, capable of switching a few tens of milliamps to ground as a lower power low side switch. This allows driving two separate loads at the same time, for example, turning on a solenoid with a FET and having an off-board indicator light or other logic level signal confirming that the higher power load has been switched on. The 16 outputs are controlled by an MCP-23017 GPIO expander, which receives its commands over I2C. The I2C connections to the GPIO expanders go to a screw terminal where an external controller can be used for this board, and the I2C also connects to an on-board controller, which is an AT-Tiny device. Depending on the intended I2C configuration, various jumpers can be installed or removed, including the ability to isolate the AT-Tiny from the I2C bus altogether, which would then allow the external I2C controller to take over on these GPIO expanders. And since the data and clock lines both need a pull-up resistor somewhere on the I2C bus, there's jumpers on this board to enable those, and that's the way we would set it if we're only using this board without an external I2C hookup. But if we do connect any other external I2C hardware, if that hardware has a pull-up already, we would either need to disable that one or disable these onboard ones. There's one GPIO expander dedicated to reading 16 5-volt logic digital inputs. These inputs can be used to directly trigger a certain output when the input is activated, or you can just set it up so that each of these pins will control a certain mode of operation. For example, you trigger the second screw terminal and all of the outputs go on and off in sequence just as a test mode or any other function needed. Or, of course, you don't even need to use inputs. You can just send commands over external I2C or RS 485. These larger screw terminals at the top of the board are the high power outputs with the FETs, and the corresponding low power NPN outputs are here with the smaller screw terminals. So when channel 1 is on, both the high power and low power channel 1 are on. Looking at the RS-485 to UART connections, if the onboard AT-Tiny is acting as the I2C controller, the AT-Tiny's UART can be configured to receive commands over RS-485 or send some status updates back out to RS-485. This allows an external controller other than I2C to provide a more robust interface, which may be good in electrically noisy environments or if using long wires to get between the controller and this board. Each of the GPIO expanders for the inputs and outputs need to be configured with a unique I2C address on these three jumpers for each chip. The main high power outputs use 5.08 mm pin spaced screw terminals rated for higher current and for flexibility the smaller screw terminals are 2.54 mm pin spacing so that allows substituting other standard 0.1 inch headers like these breakaway headers or JST headers. The board logic runs at 5 volts with an onboard regulator, so to power the board with flexibility, I want it to be able to use a 
variety of different DC sources, including wall adapters or other power supplies. So I rated the input between 6.5 to 12 volts. And because I'm going to be dropping from up to 12 volts down to 5, that alone will cause power dissipation. So I'm using a surface mount package that can easily handle the power dissipation, including the amount of current to run everything on the board. To help minimize that power dissipation, since there's a lot of LEDs on this board, I chose current limit resistor values so that I could keep the brightness of the LEDs adequate and save a few milliamps across the entire board if all LEDs are on. If I use different LEDs, I may have to recalculate these resistors based on how bright or dim the new ones are. And since these NPN transistors are only intended to draw a relatively low current, I set the base current limit resistor at 15k. So if we have a 5 volt control signal coming in and we have 0.7 volts from base to emitter with 4.3 volts across a 15k resistor and assuming the transistor gain is going to be at least 100, we could get a collector current of around 28 milliamps, which is more than adequate for turning on some sort of status LED or driving a logic input on some other circuit. And with 16 of these transistor drivers, we can save tens of milliamps on the whole board compared to if we put smaller resistors here, allowing a larger current through this transistor that we don't really need to accommodate. To test the various features on this board, I'm powering the logic from a 9 volt battery. And since these outputs are open drain or open collector, only connecting an external load to ground, we need to use an external power supply. So to power my solenoids, I'm using a bench supply for the low current outputs. To power an LED, I'm just using this 9 volt battery as an external power supply. So when the low power output is turned on, this pin connects to ground, which goes to this 9 volt battery ground. Then an LED can be connected to ground as well as already being connected to plus 9 and the LED comes on. With the solenoid, one side is connected to my positive 24 volt supply. The other solenoid wire goes to the screw terminal. So when this transistor comes on, it connects this end of the solenoid to ground, which is this large screw terminal going back to the 24 volt power supply. And being an inductive load, there should be a diode connected across the coil with cathode at the positive supply rail so that it can suppress any voltage spikes from back EMF when the solenoid is turned off and the magnetic field collapses, generating a high voltage back toward the driver. When designing the ground copper for this PCB, it was set up to try to encourage the FET switch's ground return current to head in one direction from the FET straight to that screw terminal that goes to the 24 volt power supply ground. While the logic control for the gate on each FET will have a ground return path that goes toward the other side of the board back to the logic circuits. And hopefully then there's minimal impact on the digital side from all of the high current transients on the driver side. So on the top side of the board, there's really no ground copper path along the whole board because of all the circuit tracks. And looking at the bottom, here's the ground return for the 24 volt supply. It's isolated from the digital side here and by all of these circuit tracks here. So when a FET turns on and connects an output to ground, the current will take the shortest path back to this screw terminal and the logic control for the FET will take a path back through through here to the digital ground side and the rest of the digital circuitry is relatively isolated from the high power and the logic voltage supply ground is right here so that's the shortest path hopefully taken by the digital circuits. I made a demo sketch which I gradually added functionality to starting with RS485. The ATtiny is programmed using UPDI so I used an Arduino Uno as a UPDI programmer. And this driver board must be powered from the main DC supply while programming. I didn't set it up to allow being powered from the UPDI programmer's 5 volt supply. So we only have UPDI programming pin and ground to connect up to a programmer. Using the Auto485 library, I ran a test where the board sends out a greeting message over RS485 upon power up. 
To connect the board's RS-485 to the computer for serial interfacing, I used one of those Arduino RS-485 modules along with a USB to TTL UART interface so I can open up a USB serial port using the Arduino IDE as a serial monitor and talk over RS-485 ultimately to this board. To test that the board can receive RS-485 data, I set the sketch up so that when it receives data, the ATtiny status LED will blink, and when the board specifically sees a lowercase a character, I'll get a slower LED blink to show that I can actually not only receive data, but process it. To test the high current outputs, I made several test functions, and one of them is to read eight of the digital inputs, and if they go low, turn on the corresponding digital output. And there's other functions like I can turn on all the outputs, wait a while, and then turn them all off. So it just allows me to exercise the board and see what happens when I try to draw eight or nine amps all at once. I also used an LED connected to plus nine volts and to the low power outputs so I can confirm that the NPN transistors can connect the LED to ground to turn it on. I'm using two different kinds of solenoids and they draw around half of an amp each and four of them draw a little more. So when all 16 are on at once, they draw between eight and nine amps. Here's some scope traces with a solenoid being turned on. The blue trace, which is channel three, is the FET driver output to the solenoid showing zero volts when on and 24 volts when off. The green channel four trace is the logic control on the gate of the FET showing zero volts when the FET is off and five volts when it's on. And for any scope traces showing the pinkish purplish channel two trace, that's the five volt power rail for all of the logic on the board. As expected, when switching inductive loads, there's possible transient noise from disturbances like ground bounce, so the FET gate control shows a little ringing, as does the 5 volt supply rail, but the 5 volt rail only dropped by around 200 millivolts, and it didn't cause any functional issues while testing. The resistor on the FET gate can be tweaked to help control the switching speed for the driver, turning it on faster or slower, and I found that the ringing was minimized when I used 1.5k and a little bit of a slower switching speed compared to if I used maybe 600 ohms and turned on the driver faster but got more ringing. And by having a larger resistor here, it also helps limit the current on the GPIO expander outputs when the FETs are being switched and the parasitic capacitances are charging or discharging through those GPIO pins. When simultaneously switching multiple loads, the disturbance can increase. So in the sketch, anytime an output is being turned on or off, I use a function that adds a short delay after turning it on or off to allow settling time for the solenoid. And in this case, doing this control over I squared C, I really don't even need to add a delay. I'm just doing it here to remember that it's needed. But the amount of time it takes I squared C to go and communicate automatically allows enough settling time. So as long as I'm only turning one at a time on and off, the system just runs a lot better. When controlling all the outputs on or off at once, probing one of the drivers shows that the FET gate and the solenoid power supply signals are as clean as when we're just really only activating one output on its own, even though now we've controlled all of them and we're drawing eight to nine amps. I didn't specify an overall current that the board can switch, or a maximum amount of current per channel, but if a significant current is passing through the PCB, the user will have to factor in the limitations such as ensuring that the wiring gauge can handle the overall current, and that the current in any single channel doesn't exceed the capabilities of the FET, and that the overall current is reasonable for the power supply capabilities, and the current ratings of all of the contacts and any other components in that current path. So large screw terminals like this can easily handle several amps per channel. The FET itself is rated over five amps, so I wouldn't try to draw that much current, but possibly one or two amps easily. And this is a heavy duty common ground screw terminal with four through hole pins in the board 
So that driver ground screw terminal has enough copper contact to do a bunch of current overall, give it some safety margin. I plan to use this PCB in upcoming projects, so check back to see it in use.